So Glenda and I, well, before she had to madly rush into doing, um, uh, before she got madly in, interrupted with doing the costumes and things, um, we've been watching a, a period drama thing on TV, and it's set around the time of King Henry the Sixth, not Henry the Eighth with his six wives, but Henry the Sixth, and as was the thing back then, you had at least two houses. Um, in England at that stage, you had the Tudors and you had the Yorks. And there was constant battle between these two houses as to who was on the throne. The, the House of York would be on the throne and the House of Tudor would be battling and trying to get the, the guy off the throne so that they could put their guy on. And when he was on, the other guys were battling. And it was like this back and forth the whole time. And there were always these alliances and, and that would take place and they, the guys would get people from, from in Europe and make alliances with them so they could increase the, the size of their army to overthrow the guy that was on the throne at that stage. And a lot of the times, the queen who, of the reigning king, the guy who was sitting on the throne, when these, these battles took place, they would, um, they would have to find sanctuary just to stay alive. And the place they would find sanctuary is in the church. They would go into the church and go into the basement, and there they would be safe, along with their children, while the, the battles and the wars were going on for the throne. See, the church was considered holy ground. And you dare step your foot in there and bring a war into the church situation, into the church building. And for those of you who, who, like, who enjoy Lord of the Rings, who, who likes Lord of the Rings? Yes, I know you do, Ashlyn. <laughs> okay. All right. Then, um, you know, Minas Tirith, the great, you know, there we go, scene from the film. There's old Gandalf going up to it. But Minas Tirith was a place of sanctuary that all the people of Middle Earth came to before the final battle of Mordor. So you had this whole Middle Earth people just piling into this place. And then the battle ensued, and everybody was sort of safe inside when the, the orcs came along and you know, rawr, 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 all these guys come along with their, their sort of ogre-style things, or they're not quite human, they come for this battle. And so to seek, to seek sanctuary meant that you looked for a place, you looked for refuge, um, you, you looked for safety from pursuit, you looked for safety from persecution. Or, or some other danger when you looked for sanctuary. You know, it's like a ship coming into a harbor from a, in a storm. Because in the harbor, that's where the sanctuary was for the ship. That's where the storm wasn't, where you could anchor and you would be safe. But have you ever thought of Jesus being our place of refuge? You know, with all that's happening in the world today, people rightfully get concerned. And many look for a place of safety. It could be in, in gold, it could be in, in property, it could be in wisdom, it could be in knowledge, or, or even position. The way they look for for place of safety, a place of sanctuary. But despite what we think will provide us with refuge, God through his word has shown us where we are to look for refuge, where we are to look for safety, where we're to look for meaning and for hope. And he tells us that all mankind is to flee to this place and to stay there. Not to go there and when everything seems, oh, it looks okay, and just wander out again, but to go there and stay there the whole time. And he said this in many varied ways throughout, throughout Scripture. And in particular, there's one that is pictured in the Old Testament, and it's the concept of cities of refuge. And maybe you remember reading about them in the Old Testament, where, where the people would, something, somebody did something, and then they ran off to a, a city of refuge, and they were safe there. And maybe that's all you read. You didn't take it any further. He says, oh, well, interesting, da, 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 as we were reading along. He didn't maybe go a little step deeper and see what God was trying to teach us through that. Marilyn's going to read Joshua chapter 20, verse 1 through to verse 9. 
Um, then the Lord said to Joshua, Tell the Israelites to designate the cities of ref refuge as I instructed you through Moses, so that anyone who kills a person accidentally and unintentionally may flee there and find protection from the avenger of blood. When he flees to one of these cities, he is to stand in the entrance of the city gate and state his case before the elders of that city. Then they are to admit him into their city and give him a place to live with them. If the avenger of blood pursues him, <clears throat> they must not surrender the one accused because he killed his neighbor unintentionally and without malice and a forethought. He is to stay in that city until he has stood trial before the assembly and until the death of the high priest who is serving at that time. Then he may go back to his own home in the town from which he fled. So they set apart Kadesh in Galilee, in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, Kiriath Arba, that's Hebron, in the hill country of Judah, and on the east side of the Jordan of Jericho, they designated Beza in the desert on the plateau in the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead in the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan in the tribe of Manasseh. Any of the Israelites or any alien living among them who killed someone accidentally could flee to these designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word. You might think that's just an arbitrary reading. It's not. I could tell you that. So God instructed Joshua, and he had done so before to Moses as well, to sit, set up these six cities in the land of Israel that would have the special status of, you know, they could have like a banner up above, you know, city of refuge. Welcome to Hebron, city of refuge, something like that. See, Israel in those days lived under the law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And it was a case of, well, if you did something, if you killed somebody unintentionally, and well, even intentionally, you had the death sentence above you. And if it was an intentional that you had killed this person, then of course you would, you would die there. But if, you'd, if it was accidental, you could run off to one of these cities of refuge. See, the, the, um, the, the slain person's kin could avenge the death of the one you had accidentally killed. But, you could, but if you were in the city of refuge, you were safe from it. So it was a case of, well, if I'm building a wall and uh, I accidentally bump a stone or a rock off the wall and it falls down and hits somebody and kills that person, that was unintentional. My death would still be avenged by the, whoever the, the nearest of kin was of that person. So I could run off to a city of refuge and find safety there. Or if I was chopping wood, and these are examples from the Bible, if I was chopping wood and the axe head accidentally came off and struck somebody and he died, then that was an accidental death. But still, my, it, this person's death could be avenged. So I could run off to a city of refuge. But these cities of refuge are not just, it's not just a geography lesson for us today. There's a spiritual significance as well in them. And firstly, that we, we see that these cities of refuge are a, were given by God. God said that you, you are going to have these cities of refuge. And right from the first, first sin of Adam and Eve, he has always been the one who has sought to provide a place of sa safety and security and shelter for the sinner. God's always been that one to do that. So now, whether they would... If a person would like to take that place of safety and, and shelter and protection, that's their own matter. But the heart of God has always been there to supply a place of refuge for the sinner, that place of, of safety, that place of forgiveness. Then God placed these cities. If you want to put the next slide up, it's the one with the map. See that You can see how they are situated. Right. So you've got... Three on the east and three on the west. You've got north and south as well. They're all pretty well spaced out. 
See, God wasn't making it hard to try and reach these cities. It wasn't just one city and if you were down here at the bottom, you were living down here somewhere, you'd have to run all the way up to the top to get out and to get to a place of safety. God put them in such a place that the settlements around them were within 50 or 60 kilometers maximum. And then you could get to it. It would take two days to get to a city of refuge, or shorter if you were running, if the guy was pursuing you. So they were all there. It was easy to get to, a place of, of, of ease. And it's the same for us today. We don't have to run, we don't have to flee physically to find a spiritual place. But God does ask us to come in humility and with faith in our hearts, knowing that there is that place of refuge there. We don't have to go and look for it. It's there. It's there within reach. All we've got to do is come to the King of Kings and ask for his refuge. So the city of refuge were for everybody. Young and old, male, female, free, slave, Jew, Gentile, everybody. As verse 6 of Joshua 20 says, Any of the Israelites or any alien living among them who killed somebody accidentally could flee to the designated cities and not be killed by the avenger of blood prior to standing trial before the assembly. And this is one of those whosoever verses. Now, whosoever did it, no matter who you were, you could flee to one of these cities of, of refuge and be, be saved there. There's another whosoever verse that we know very well. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, whoever, young, old, male, female, slave, free, Israelite, Jew, Gentile, whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. Whoever. The invitation is available to anyone. And everyone should take advantage of it. To move to the, cities of, to the city of refuge with the king of kings. And then there was an interesting one. When the high priest died, when the high priest died, the perpetrators who were living in these cities of refuge could go free. They were, no longer, they were no longer needing to stay within the city because the avenger was trying to get to them. Their crime, their unintentional crime, had been erased. They were allowed to go free when the high priest died. And why? Because they reckoned that the high priest, his righteousness, was atoned for the, for the sin. The high priest's righteousness had atoned for the sin. It atoned for the mistake that you'd made. Does that sound familiar? When the high priest died, the mistake was atoned for. The death of the ultimate high priest, Jesus Christ, is the one whose death sets us free. Sets us free from our sin. And this passage pictures Christ in every aspect. If you read it again for yourself in Joshua 20, it's, it's just the whole of chapter 20. Every aspect of it talks about Christ, except one person. See, the innocent one killed is a picture of Christ who died for doing no wrong. The city of refuge that provides shelter and safety is a picture of Christ. The high priest is a picture of Christ whose death sets us free. The, the city of refuge that provides shelter and safety is the picture of Christ for the one who's running. Even the avenger of blood, the one who comes running after the, the one who killed, is a picture of Christ in that it's his death that sets those free in the city. Because Jesus comes along with justice and he comes with righteousness and he judges and he wages war. He's the avenger of blood for those who haven't sought refuge. But there's one, there's one person in this, in this chapter that is not a type of Christ. And that's the one who's committed the crime. And the person who's fleeing. And that is a picture of us as sinners. 
So what about those people who decided not to flee? Those who, who said, well, okay, look, I'm going, going to take my chance. I'm going to stay here, even though I unintentionally, it was unintentional. I can prove it. I'm still going to stay here. What becomes of them? Well, outside of the city of refuge, there was no safety for them at all. The avenger could come and at any time. He could come that day. He could come tomorrow. He could come next week. He could come next year. You didn't know when the avenger was going to come. Because the avenger of blood was going to come sometime. He was going to come and seek revenge for what you had done. And those of the perpetrator, you were just living on borrowed time until the avenger came. What a horrible position to be in. Knowing that despite the, the fact that this was accidental, there was still somebody going to come to avenge that death. What does the Bible say of those people who choose not to use the place of safety? We saw it last week. We saw it. Fools. You'd be a fool not to use a place of refuge. Be a fool, a fool not to go to the city of refuge, not to be in Christ. Those people who don't take Christ as their city of refuge die as fools. And one of the one of the roles of the Levite priests was to make sure that the city of refuge was easily accessible. In other words, they they would make the pathways wide. That's I think it was like 14 meters wide or something, to the city. So there would be no obstacles. Any rocks that were in the way were moved out of the way. It was a straight road going in. So there was no hindrance. When you were on your way there and there at the city, you could get in fast and, and, and quick with no problem at all. All obstacles were moved. And how does that speak to us today? Well, believers today are those people that have fled and and found refuge. But we're also those priests. Those priests that assist others in finding the city of refuge. The priests would put up signs outside the city and, and along the road towards the city saying, city of refuge, this way. Are we putting signs up saying, Jesus Christ, this way. City of refuge is in this direction. Well, unfortunately, there's, there are so many other signs today that are pointing in different directions. There's, you know, find freedom in, in this philosophy or find freedom in, in this school of thought or find freedom in this new age practice or save the planet, hug the tree and uh, save your soul here instead of pointing to Jesus. The voices and the signs are many and they're varied but we need to be the sign that points to the city of Jesus, the city of refuge that we find in him. Because Jesus has made it as easy as possible. He's removed all obstacles. He's removed everything from the way. It's, simple, it's simply coming to him and saying, Father, I've sinned. Accept me as your child. That's it. No other, other thing. There's no hindrance at all in coming to Christ. Are you a signboard pointing others to Jesus? Are you doing that? Saying Jesus is this way. This way to the city of refuge. So what are those who, who do make it to the city of refuge? What are those who do find their safety in Christ? What do they find? Well, God chooses the cities. God chose these, these six cities as a picture of what we have in Christ. In the north, we've got Kadesh, up at the north there. Kadesh means sanctuary. It's a refuge. The sanctuary is a refuge. It's a sanctuary is a, a place of rest. Rest, safe, 